Um, welcome to the first session of uh, the morning. And uh, this session is going to start with the Best Paper Award. Yeah, okay, so uh, when we were putting together the program, uh, we wanted to do two tweaks to how the Best Paper Award worked, I guess. Um, the first is we wanted to uh, allocate a longer slot to the Best Paper in recognition of that. Um, so this is sort of halfway between an invited talk and a, and a standard talk, I guess you could say. And the second thing is we put the invited, uh, we put the Best Paper Award talk uh, the morning after the banquet as kind of a carrot to encourage people to come along. I'm kind of glad that that's sort of worked out. There's plenty of people here. Um, and the reason for that is that we also wanted to uh, give out the Best Paper Awards to the authors uh, before the presentation rather than at the rump session, partly because uh, that means they'll actually be here. Um, so the Best Paper Award for Chess 2018 was voted for by the editorial board. Um, as you heard the other day, we had 180 or so submissions um, 40 or 50 or so of which were accepted. So this is um, uh, yeah, a fantastic achievement, you could say. So I'd like to invite Martin and Amit. Uh, Kenny's not able to be here uh, onto the stage to, to receive the award. So we, we also have a gift. Um, we weren't able to locate any cold boots, but we did get some wooden shoes. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's a pretty bad joke, but I'll, I'll take it anyway. So yeah, we have, have three of these. Hopefully you can take uh, Kenny's home as well for him. Okay, so without further ado, we'll hand over to the session chair to start the session. Thank you, Dan. So, Hamid is going to, to give the talk. Okay, so uh, yeah, hello everyone. Today I'll be speaking about cold boot attacks on Ring and Modri LWE secret keys when the NTT is used to store the key. Um, yeah, and before I start, this is based on joint work by myself and my supervisors, uh, Martin Albrecht and Kenny Patterson. Okay, so um, first of all, uh, what are these cold boot attacks? Well, they were originally investigated in the literature, at least by Haldeman et al. in 2009. And the attack basically uh, involves an attacker who has physical access to a victim's machine. And the idea is that there will be some cryptographic secret key material stored in, this, um, in, the, in the victim's memory, so the attacker can eject the memory, plug it into their own machine, and then essentially take an, a reading of the bits. And at this point, the attacker has two challenges. The first is to locate the key material in the memory, and the second is to use data remnants effects to actually recover the secret key. Okay, so clearly these work on any cryptographic primitive where there's a secret key stored in memory, so the attack's quite a general one. However, the attacker we're modeling here is an extremely powerful one, so it's one that has physical access to a victim's machine. Okay, so a few more details on what Haldeman et al. showed in 2009. Well, they showed that there's this data remnants um, where if you cut power to RAM, eventually um, the, any information in the RAM goes towards this kind of ground state as shown by this decaying picture of the Mona Lisa. Okay, what they also showed is that you can actually slow down this sort of decay by cooling the RAM chips to extreme temperatures. So even if you just use compressed air for the cooling, you can actually achieve a less than 1% bit flip rate towards some ground state um, after some period of time. So I'll speak more about what this ground state is in the next slide. But you can also um, reduce this bit flip rate by using more extreme methods of cooling, such as using liquid nitrogen. Okay, so um, yeah. So all of this is basically based on the 
fact that when you cut power to RAM, eventually the bits in the memory will decay to either a zero state or a one state. In fact, there will be regions that decay to zero states and regions that decay to a one state. And once again, you call the RAM to extreme temperatures to slow down this decay. Um, yeah, and before I move on, when I say RAM, what I really mean is DRAM here. Okay, so uh, now we move on to an example. Suppose we have a 12-bit secret key in the victim's memory. So this is the true value of the secret key. Well, the idea is that the attacker comes along, he, uh, they freeze and extract the RAM, and then perhaps they take this kind of noisy reading of the secret key, where some of the bits have flipped. And at this point, the attacker needs to detect these bit flips, correct them, in, and correct them in order to recover the secret key. Okay, so eventually, if the attacker was to leave the RAM at, uh, say, room temperature or any sort of temperature, eventually, we reach the ground state of, of these regions of zeros and regions of ones. Okay, so um, in addition to these standard bit flips that go towards the memory's ground state, um, there are also these retrograde bit flips that actually go away from the memory ground state. However, these occur at a much lower rate of row one, where row one is roughly 0.1% according to the experiments of Haldeman et al. So in addition to this, I'll be using row zero to denote the standard bit flip rate. Okay, so um, whenever we launch a cold boot attack, a standard sort of assumption is that the number of bit flips we'll see is the number of bits in the key that we're attacking times the average of the two rates. And implicitly, uh, in order to make this assumption, we're assuming that half the bits of the secret key are in the ground state. Okay, so before I move on, um, uh, whenever I give you a bit flip rate that contains two sort of numbers, the first one's going to uh, represent row naught, and the second one's going to represent row one. Okay, so uh, what's kind of known about these cold boot attacks on the popular cryptographic primitives? Well, for DES and AES, it's been shown that there are extremely effective cold boot attacks, even at fairly high bit flip rates of, of more than 50%. And just to give you some background as to, to how these attacks sort of work, or what they take advantage of, well, for DES and AES, uh, these attacks assume that not only do you have the secret key stored in memory, but you also have a number of rounds of the key schedule stored in memory. So essentially, um, taking advantage of this kind of redundant information between the key schedule and the actual key, you can actually launch very effective cold boot attacks on DES and AES. A similar story holds for RSA, where um, it's been shown that you can correct uh, flip rates of roughly 40% in the standard direction, in just a few seconds. So once again, um, this attack uses redundancy in what's stored in the memory. In particular, if RSA is implemented according to the PKCS1 standard, you don't just get the secret key in memory, you also get some other functions of the secret key in memory. And more recently, um, there's been some uh, work on cold boot attacking entry. And it was actually shown that at fairly low bit flip rates, but still the realistic ones that Haldeman et al. showed were um, feasible, you can actually recover entry keys in a matter of minutes to hours using fairly straightforward enumeration techniques. Okay, so uh, next to motivate our work, well, as you've already heard throughout this conference, NIST is running this uh, process or competition, and many of them are actually based on the LWE problem. So a natural open question in the, in the cold boot area is to ask, are there effective cold boot attacks on some of these LWE contenders? And what we actually look at is um, attacks on any scheme that uses an NTT to store uh, its secret key in the memory. Okay, so uh, next we get on to uh, defining our cold boot problem. And in order to understand the problem, we first need to understand what an LWE key looks like, or at least what the LWE keys that we'll be attacking look like. So in actual fact, we'll be focusing on ring and module LWE, which are two of the perhaps main efficient variations of LWE used in NIST, uh, used in NIST proposals. And in order to define the, the keys, we need to fix a polynomial ring. And the polynomial ring we'll be using is going to be the power of two cyclotomics, because this allows you to use an NTT. Okay, so in other words, we're going to be fixing the ring R sub Q, where 
This ring is essentially the ring of polynomials whose coefficients are integers modulo q, quotiented out by x to the n plus 1. Okay, so these are degree at most n minus 1 polynomials whose coefficients are integers modulo q. So for ring LWE, the secret key is simply one of these ring elements or polynomials. However, for module LWE, the secret key is a collection of d of these polynomials. However, there's an interesting um, trade-off between d and n. So what module LWE schemes tend to do is use a smaller ring dimension n at the expense of using a non-trivial d. So for example, um, Kaiba, which is a module LWE-based scheme, uses n equals 256 and d equals 3 whereas the ring LW-based New Hope uses a much larger ring dimension, but we only have one polynomial making up the secret key. Okay, so how are these um, uh, keys stored in memory for some of these uh, LWE proposals? Well, it's been kind of um, said before that the number theoretic transform, or NTT, speeds up multiplication, polynomial multiplication, from roughly n squared operations to n log n operations. So in order to take advantage of this kind of speed up, it's often the case that polynomials in the secret key will simply be stored in the NTT domain so that you can uh, perform very fast multiplication without needing to apply an NTT to the secret key every time you want to do a polynomial multiplication. Okay, so uh, next we can actually define our cold boot problem. So essentially what we want to do is to decode a noisy NTT or recover this s from s tilde, where s tilde is the entity of s plus some error vector delta. Um, so we're actually going to be making an assumption throughout this talk, and that is going to be that we have kappa bit flips where kappa is much less than n. And of course, you don't want to make this assumption in general. However, for the purposes of our attack, um, we actually require this assumption. Okay, so uh, next, giving more details on what this error vector delta looks like. Well, remember, delta corresponds to bit flips. However, delta is also um, represented as an integer modulo q vector here. So essentially, what this means is that the components of delta are not small when considered as integers modulo q, because they can, uh, they, they're associated to bit flips. However, if we assume a low number of bit flips, then delta's components should have a low Hamming weight when written in some binary signed digit representation, or BSDR. So uh, briefly, what, what is a BSDR? Well, it's essentially a binary representation where um, each bit has a sign attached to it. And we really need this signed digit representation because there are bit flips that go from 0 to 1 and bit flips that go from 1 to 0. Okay, so. An example of a BSDR of 7 is 1, 0, 0, minus 1, since 7 is 1 times 8 take away 1. And this example kind of highlights that BSDRs are not unique because we could also have the binary representation of 7. So this is kind of something that I'll be um, ignoring for the purposes of this talk, but if you want to see more details on this, uh, please read the paper. Okay, so once again, if we assume kappa bit flips, we would assume that uh, we're essentially assuming that the BSDR of delta should have a Hamming weight of k, uh, kappa, sorry. And whenever I say the BSDR of delta, what I really mean is the concatenation of the BSDR of its individual components. Okay, so the final thing to be said about this uh, NTT problem is that S has small coefficients, which is essentially a standard uh, design choice in that all of these ring and module LWE schemes use. Okay, so just to come back to these, uh, these examples of Kyber and New Hope, in actual fact, Kyber consists of three um, relatively low dimensional ring elements. So in order to recover a full Kyber secret key, we have to decode three noisy entities in a relatively low dimension, whereas for New Hope, we have to decode one noisy entity in a relatively high dimension. Okay, so um, finally we get onto our attack, and our attack splits into three main components. The first is a divide and conquer sort of strategy to reduce the dimension of our problem. And essentially what this, uh, this component uses is that we can compute an NTT using fast Fourier transform techniques. Okay, so the second uh, component that I'll describe is how to work a solution up from one of these low dimensional instances all the way up to uh, the solution to our original problem of decoding the noisy NTT.
And finally, I'll speak about um, how we actually solve these low dimensional instances that we get from dividing, dividing and conquering. Okay, so first of all, how do we divide and conquer? Well, if you recall, um, the NTT is uh, essentially a Fourier transform over the integers modulo Q. And the form explicit formula for the NTT that's used is uh, given on this slide. And you'll actually see that um, there's this isn't quite uh, analogous to a Fourier transform because of this factor of um, omega to the half j in the summons. And um, yeah, so nonetheless, even it, despite this difference, we can still use fast Fourier transforms, uh, fast FFT techniques to quickly compute an NTT. So essentially, what that means is that we can write an NTT in dimension n in terms of two NTTs in dimension n over two, and so on. Okay, so what are the formulae that allow us to do this? Well, they're given by um, the two equations in the box here. And the main thing to, to take from this, to take from these formulae is that um, taking the sum and difference of the i th and i plus n over 2 components of an n-dimensional NTT gives you something in terms of the i th component of an n over 2 dimensional NTT. Okay, so, um, yeah. Uh, moving on, how do we use this to divide and conquer R instance? Well, recall that R instance is given by this S tilde, where S tilde is a noisy NTT. So in actual fact, taking the sum and difference of the i th and i plus n over 2 th components of S tilde, and using the formula from the previous slide, we can actually get um, equations 1 and 2. And we call the, uh, the first of these the positive fold and the second the negative fold. Okay, so if you look more carefully at the positive fold, um, you'll see that it essentially has the same form as our original instance. It's essentially, on the right-hand side, what we have is two times um, yeah, an, a noisy NTT. The only difference is that there's a, factor, a constant factor of two in front of the NTT. And this essentially means that we can divide and conquer um, the positive fold once again in, using the same techniques. However, for the second um, of these equations, so the negative fold, we have this annoying factor of omega to the i plus a half in front of the NTT, which kind of uh, prevents us from dividing and conquering in any effective way. So essentially, we can repeatedly fold down the positive folded instance, or repeatedly divide and conquer down the positive folded instance. Okay, so the question is, how many times can we actually do this? Um, and can we actually reach a trivial dimension by uh, repeatedly dividing and conquering? Well, in order to understand the answer to this question, we have to look at the, um, the new error vectors that are introduced when we divide and conquer. So these are actually given by delta plus and delta minus. And if we write delta L as the left uh, n over 2 components of delta, and delta R as the right n over 2 components of delta, essentially what delta plus and delta minus are are the sums and differences of delta L and delta R. Okay, so, um, yeah, what this essentially means is that if we have, um, the, if the BSDR of delta is kappa, then we expect that the BSDR of delta plus and delta minus should have a Hamming weight of kappa as well. And this is essentially because we're making the assumption that um, kappa is extremely small compared to N. Okay, so essentially, um, yeah, delta plus and delta minus have a much less sparse uh, representation when written in BSDR compared to delta, because we have the same Hamming weight, but um, the ones and minus ones are packed into uh, half the dimension. Okay, so essentially, what this means is that if we repeatedly fold, um, we uh, we are packing um, kappa ones and minus ones into a smaller and smaller amount of space. And if we do this, eventually these sort of noise terms will um, approach a uniform distribution. Because even packing a small number of ones and minus ones into a smaller and smaller amount of space uh, gives us something that's uh, fairly uniform looking. So if we divide and conquer so many times uh, that this error term approaches the uniform distribution, then what we're asking to do to solve the low dimensional instance is to, um, so is to decode a noisy NTT where the noise is essentially uniform. 
which is clearly an ill-defined problem, because anything is a solution to that problem. OK, so the final note on this slide says that the S terms stay the same size, so whenever we divide and conquer, the S terms, or the thing that the NTT is applied to, uh, stays the same size, so it doesn't cause any problems. But remember, this delta term, or the error term, is what really causes us issues when dividing and conquering. OK, so to summarize the divide and conquer component of our attack, um, we start off with this top level instance, which is our original noisy NTT. We can divide and conquer this once, and then we can divide and conquer down the positive fold because it has the same form as our original instance, and so on, until we reach some bottom level uh, pair of instances. And it's important that these bottom level instances uh, represent well defined problems. So essentially, the number of times you can divide and conquer depends on the parameters you're attacking. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm gonna, we're going to assume that we divide and conquer three times. Okay, so the next uh, component of the attack is how to work a solution up from the bottom level all the way up to the top level. And in fact, uh, the way our attack works is that we work the solution up one level at a time. So what I'll describe is how to work a solution up from the n over 2 dimensional level to the n dimensional level. So from the second to top level to the top level. And then working the solution up the other levels is an entirely analogous process. OK, so um, if you recall the formula for uh, delta plus and delta minus, well, essentially, we're just adding the left half of delta and the right half of delta. And once again, making this assumption that we have kappa bit flips where kappa is much less than n, if we expand uh, delta plus in the BSDR, then the ones and minus ones in that either come from delta L or delta R. So if we're given a solution to delta plus, we can expand it in its BSDR and then um, guess which ones and minus ones come from the left half of delta and which come from the right half of delta. And what this ends up meaning is that um, if we have kappa bit flips, we require at most two to the kappa guesses to work a solution up one level. Okay, so another thing is that whenever we make a guess for, um, for working the, the solution up, we can actually verify this guess by plugging into the sibling instance or the parent instance. So each time we make a guess, we can verify it. And what this means is if we want to work up k levels, then we require at most k times 2 to the kappa guesses. OK, so of course, there's a small complication when the bit flips in delta L and delta R collide, but um, for the purposes of this talk, I'm, I'm going to ignore it. But we do take this into account in the paper. OK, so what we have so far is that we built this divide and conquer tree using the structure of the NTT. And if we have an oracle that solves one of these bottom level instances, we know by guessing how to um, Work, work the solution up one level and continually work it up one level at a time until we reach the solution to the top level instance. The question that remains is how do we actually solve this bottom level instance? And a good starting point is to compare our instance to an LW instance. So remember, we're solving a bottom level instance here, so the dimension of this NTT is going to be small. And actually, to, in order to compare our instance to an LW instance, it's quite useful to take an inverse NTT on our bottom level instance. So essentially, we've transformed the problem of uh, decoding a noisy NTT into a problem of decoding a noisy inverse NTT now. So in this section of the talk, we're going to be decoding a noisy inverse NTT. OK, so here's a table of comparisons between our instance and um, a standard LW instance. Um, so the main uh, comparison that I want to highlight here is that is the, the last one, so the fact that delta does not have a small Euclidean norm. However, the analogous term in, in LWE does have a small Euclidean, Euclidean norm. And this is one of the main uh, difficulties in trying to solve our instance using LWE techniques. However, we can uh, begin by looking at like, how to solve this using LW techniques and see how far we get. And we'll do that by looking at the bounded distance decoding problem. OK, so uh, briefly, what is this bounded distance decoding problem, or BDD problem? Well, essentially, you're given a lattice 
and the input to the problem is a target vector t along with the radius r, and you promise that the distance from this target vector to the lattice is at most r. And the answer to the problem, or the solution to the problem, is the closest lattice point to the target vector. Okay, so how do we um, embed our instance into some BDD problem, the kind of LWE way? Well, the first thing to note is that we'll be using, we'll be embedding our n prime dimensional instance, where n prime is, uh, you can think of it as being 32, as an example, into a two times n prime BDD instance. And the way this is usually done is that we define the target vector where the first n prime coordinates are zero and the second n prime coordinates are given by our noisy inverse NTT. Then we construct this lattice that satisfies the linear relation that the NTT inverse on the first n prime coordinates added to the second n prime coordinates gives you zero modulo q. And finally, you use a BDD solver, some BDD solver, to find the closest vector in, in the lattice and hope that the offset vector is delta s, which is our solution to the bottom level instance. OK, so why does this work? Well, we know that uh, delta concatenated with the minus NTT inverse of delta is a lattice point, And the offset from the target to this lattice point is our solution, delta s. So a perfect BDD solver will actually uh, return this lattice point if it's the closest one um, to the target. And essentially, we can guarantee that this is the case if the norm of delta s, or the norm of our like, target offset vector, is less than half the length of the shortest vector in lambda, in the lattice. Okay, so to emphasize the point, our main sort of success condition that we're aiming to satisfy is to um, essentially, given a perfect BDD solver, we want to make sure the, our target offset, which happens to be delta s here, so our solution, has a norm that is less than half the length of the shortest vector in lambda. So you want delta s to be short. However, there's an immediate problem here, and it's that delta s is not short. Because if you look at delta as an integer vector, then the components of it aren't small. Even though it, it, it um, well, the, the main reason for this is because it corresponds to bit flips. OK, so a first step in trying to like, shorten this target offset vector of delta s is to consider a base 2 to the L SDR of delta instead of delta in the offset, in our target offset. And in order to do this, we actually fixed L equals the log of root Q. We redefined the lattice by introducing this tensor product, so I'm not going to go into any of the details really here. And we update the target vector. And if you go through the same analysis using these updated um, sort of target vectors and lattices, the offset vector that we're aiming to be short is now the base 2 to the LSDR of delta, along with S. And the interesting thing is each component of the base 2 to the LSDR of delta has a size at most root Q, has an absolute value of at most root Q, because we fixed this particular L. Whereas the absolute value of the size of um, um, the original delta had, had um, norm around Q, so max, a, a maximal norm of around Q. So essentially, this base 2 to the LSDR of delta is a shorter vector than delta is, even though it's uh, in a high dimension. So there are two main things to note about this technique. The a lattice that we're actually running BDD on, or trying to solve BDD on, is actually higher than it was before, has a higher dimension than it, was, than it had before. So the increase is from 2n prime, which is the dimension of the old lattice, to 3n prime, which is the dimension of this lattice. And using this tensor product, we actually introduce a new class of vectors. Um, for example, one vector in this class is 2 to the L, uh, minus 1, followed by um, zeros. And this, vector, this class of vectors, well, they all have a norm of roughly root Q. So essentially, our offset vector is now um, the base 2 to the LSDR of delta, along with S, but our lattice now contains shortish vectors of length root q. So we actually haven't achieved our aim yet. Our offset isn't shorter than all of the, lattice, all of the vectors in our lattice. OK, so in order to uh, shorten this target offset further, what we end up doing is we deploy this kind of hybrid uh, guessing approach 
where we basically want to shorten the offset vector of base 2 to the L of S the, the base 2 to the L SDR of delta. And in order to do this, we simply guess the upper bits of this, of each um, symbol in the base 2 to L SDR of delta. So fixing our particular L, we have that each component of delta, when written in the base 2 to the L SDR, has two, two uh, integers attached to it. And um, what we end up doing is we essentially split these integers into the upper bits. So these are the red blocks in this diagram and the lower bits, which are the yellow blocks. So the idea is that we guess the upper bits. So we guess the red blocks. We update our target vector. And now our offset vector is in terms of um, the yellow bits. So essentially, we shortened our offset vector without changing the lattice or anything like this. Okay, so it turns out that this strategy actually does uh, solve the problem, more or less. Okay, so um, all of this was kind of described in terms of having a perfect BDD solver. But in practice, uh, the BDD problem is an extremely hard problem to solve, for uniform lattices at least. However, our lattices um, have some structure attached to them because they use an NTT in the definition. In the definition. And as our experiments showed, our lattices um, stray far away from what the theory of uniform lattices kind of tells us. So as evidence of this, we actually obtained, well, we had a 96-dimensional lattice, and we obtained a BKZ 90 reduced basis of this lattice. Then what we did was, uh, to investigate this kind of uh, non-uniformity of our lattice, we plotted the log length of the Gram-Schmidt vectors against the basis vector labels. And what you'd expect for a uniform lattice is this blue line. However, for our lattice, we observed the red line. And clearly, this uh, well, the difference between the red line and the blue line is quite large. And Essentially, what this means is that we can't really rely on the standard lattice theory uh, to analyze the performance of our attack. So instead, we actually run these uh, BD, run our, or create a BDD solver in order to understand how our attack performs. And we, run, we use the BDD solver, well, we build a BDD solver by using BDD enumeration. OK, so um, yeah, that concludes the description of the attack. Now, what is the overall complexity of the attack? Well, uh, the steps of the attack kind of divide into these uh, natural um, yeah, components. So first of all, divide and conquer just um, asks us to add a few integers together. So the complexity of this stage is fairly trivial. And we actually had to, uh, we also have to reduce a basis in order to perform BDD enumeration. However, the lattice basis um, is kind of fixed over all cold boot instances um, when attacking a single scheme. So this is essentially done once and for all. Because if you notice, we kind of solve BDD on the same lattice multiple times. Um, the next thing is um, this BDD enumeration phase. And this actually ends up dominating the complexity of our attack. And in particular, this is made worse because um, if you remember, in order to shorten our target offset vector, we had to make some guesses of the top bits. And essentially, once we make a guess of the top bits, we have to run a BDD enumeration for each guess. So in our attack, we don't run one BDD enumeration. We run many, many BDD enumerations. So this is the phase that actually dominates. And finally, working the solution up to tree, although it costs two to the kappa bit flip, uh, two to the kappa sort of operations, roughly speaking. Um, this actually doesn't end up dominating our attack in terms of what we found in our experiments, at least not for the cappers that we analyzed. OK, so here are our experimental results. So we got these results by producing 200 cold boot instances for the Kyber and New Hope parameters. We then varied our attack parameters, the various uh, sort of attack parameters. Um, and ran experiments using the different configurations of attack parameters. And these are essentially our, our best uh, figures. In addition to running experiments on our NTT attack, we also estimated how long we would expect a naive cold boot attack to work if the NTT was not used to store the secret key. 
and this is given by the last column in this table. Okay, so the first thing you'll notice is that for Kaiba, we actually analyzed much larger row noughts than we did for New Hope. So for Kaiba, row naught is uh, roughly, well, we went up to roughly a few percent, whereas for New Hope, all of the row noughts we analyzed were at much less than 1%. And this is essentially because New Hope uses a much larger ring dimension than Kaiba. So this change in parameters um, really does seem to affect our attack. Uh, the second thing that's interesting here is that we can compare the cost of our NTT attack compared to the, the non-NTT cost. And for Kaiba, which is the module LWE-based scheme, we actually see that there's a, quite a large gap between the cost of attacking um, an NTT encoding of a secret versus the cost of attacking a non-NTT encoding. However, for New Hope, this kind of comparison is less clear because sometimes the NTT is cheap, the NTT attack is cheaper, and sometimes our estimates of the non-NTT attack is cheaper. Okay, so to conclude, um, yeah, we've shown that the structure of the NTT can actually be exploited by cold boot attackers. For Kaiba parameters, it seems that the NTT, at least for the bit flips we looked at, um, seems to allow for a faster attack than the case where the NTT is not used. For New Hope, this, uh, this um, phenomenon was not really observed in our experiments. But nonetheless, our recommendation for the time being would be that if cold boot attacks are a concern, it's worth not storing your secrets using an NTT. That's not to say um, you shouldn't use an NTT. You can still use the NTT, but just don't store the secret um, in memory using an, N an NTT. Okay, so yeah, the idea behind this recommendation is to sort of guard off against improvements to our attack because the NTT really is introducing some structure that a crypt analyst might be able to uh, exploit. Okay, so future directions. Um, the first one would be to kind of study how to solve these general LW-like problems with these strange uh, low Hemingweight BSDR secrets. And the second would be to uh, try to exploit the rich algebraic structure of the NTTs further. So if you saw our lattice, um, it was highly non-uniform. It had a lot of structure to it. So um, yeah, I, th I think we all kind of think that um, if we were able to exploit the structure of the NTT further, we could certainly speed up our attack. And yeah, that's all I have to say. I've got some references, and I'll, I'll be happy to take any questions you have. Thanks. Thank you. We have time for questions. Ah, oh, I see. They're, they're just references. I didn't want to leave them up. <laughs> Other question or comment? No? Uh, maybe I have one, one, uh, one question. Uh, what is the cause? What is the loss if we don't represent the, the secret uh, with entity? Uh, what is the loss? Yeah, what is the loss? Yeah, you, you recommend if call book attacks are, uh, are concerned, it is worth not storing secrets using NTT. Is there, is there efficiency loss if we don't? Ah, yeah. So um, usually uh, whenever you multiply two polynomials, it's easier to multiply the NTT of a polynomial with the NTT of the second polynomial. So essentially, whenever we want to do like A times S, um, it's faster if we already have the NTT of A and the NTT of S to multiply the two polynomials. However, if you have just A and S, you have to first compute the NTT of A and then the NTT of S, mm. and then do the, the multiplication uh, operation. So it, it does uh, affect efficiency of some of these schemes, but only slightly. Yeah, it's negligible compared to the... Um, no? Well, I'm not 100% sure if it's negligible, but yeah, it, I, I don't really know it, how, how it affects the concrete performance of these schemes, actually. Question, comment? No? Please thank the speaker again.